Hey everyone, and welcome to my problem-solving guides for electrophysiology. This is a rather specific series of videos for a university course that isn't common in most places, but that's fine, I had time to kill so I made it anyway. There's also a number of you that might find it useful at some point. So let's start with a really easy problem, and believe me, as you go on in the course, the problems only get tougher, so be prepared. So you have a spherical neuron that's 20 microns in diameter, so something like this ball that I've drawn here. Notice how I'm labeling important parts of the problem as I read through it. This is a practice I recommend adopting because it helps you zone in on important parts of the problem. Anyway, the spherical neuron has a resting membrane potential of negative 65 millivolts. So if I zoom into a small patch along the sphere, then I'll find that the inner part of the neuron is negative with respect to the outer part of the neuron by 65 millivolts. You're also given the resting input resistance, which is 500 mega ohms. What this means is that when the cell is resting, meaning that it's just sitting there and there's nothing happening to it, there are a small number of ion channels that are open and conducting ions while the cell is in the resting state. The resistance of the cell due to these channels that are open by default is 500 mega ohms. But if there weren't any channels open at all in the resting state, this resistance would be much higher. It would approach infinity. But because there are channels open, you get a finite but still large resistance. You can translate this input resistance to an input conductance by taking the reciprocal, because remember, conductance is just 1 over the resistance. In this case, the conductance would just be 2 nanosiemens. Siemens is just the standard unit of conductance. Hopefully you've understood everything I've said so far, but if you haven't, be sure to ask in the comments. So let's get started on the actual problem. The first part asks you to find the time constant of the neuron. That's pretty easy. It's just the time constant of a resistor capacitor circuit. Just the resistance of the membrane, which is at rest right now, so it's just the input resistance, times the capacitance of the membrane, C sub n. We already know the input resistance from the given info, but we don't exactly know the membrane capacitance. However, determining that isn't too difficult because you just have to recall one special rule, and this is a rule that you should probably memorize. And that rule is that the specific capacitance, meaning the capacitance of a 1 centimeter squared patch of membrane, that's 1 microfarad. This is a known and constant property of the phospholipid bilayer that makes up the cell membrane. So remember it. In this case, we all know that the cell is a sphere. So the total surface area of the membrane would just be the surface area of that sphere, which is pi times this diameter squared. If you do the calculation, then you'll find that the surface area of the cell is around 1260 square microns. To get the capacitance of the membrane, you just multiply this area by the specific capacitance. Canceling out the micron squared gives us a capacitance of 1.25663 times 10 to the negative 11 farads. Just a quick note. Always, always keep track of your units and conversion factors. I cannot stress this enough. If you lose track of your units, it's very easy to mess up and end up with a completely wrong answer. So we have both the capacitance and the input resistance. If we multiply them both together, we'll get approximately 6.28 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds, which is 6.28 milliseconds. So we're done with part A now, so let's go to part B. The neuron receives an excitatory synapse, so something like in this diagram. When that synapse fires, it opens a bunch of non-selective channels with a synaptic conductance of 500 picosiemens. Pico, by the way, just means 10 to the power negative 12. What is the amplitude of the synaptic current, given that the reversal potential is negative 50 millivolts and that the membrane potential Vm just stays constant? Now you know that the current through a channel, or a bunch of channels, is just the conductance of that channel, or group of channels, multiplied by the driving force. This is just like saying how fast blood travels through my system is just the product of how forcefully I push the blood through that system, which is analogous to the driving force, multiplied by how easy it is to push that blood, which is analogous to the conductance. 
Similar idea here. In this case, the synaptic current would just be the synaptic conductance multiplied by the driving force, which is the difference between the voltage the synaptic channels want to be at, or the reversal potential, and the voltage the synaptic channels are actually at, which is the membrane potential. Notice how I'm only using the synaptic conductance here and not the other conductance we found above, which was the resting input conductance. That's because I'm only concerned with the synaptic current that travels through the synaptic channels, and not with any other current that's going through the channels that were already open by default. If we do the calculation, then we know that the synaptic conductance is 500 picosiemens, the reversal potential is negative 15 millivolts, and the membrane potential is negative 65 millivolts. Because the question says that since Vm stays constant, that just means that it hasn't changed from its resting value we mentioned up here. So what we get is that the synaptic current is 500 picosiemens times negative 65 plus 15 times 10 to the power negative 3 volts, which is negative 2.5 times 10 to the negative 11 amperes or negative 25 picoamps. Notice that the current is negative. And that means that positive charge is going inside the cell, just our sign convention for current. The third part now asks you what the input resistance and time constant of the neuron are when the synapse fires. And here's where you'll have to recall the definition of input resistance or conductance. Similar idea. The input resistance or conductance tells you how much the membrane potential of a cell changes in response to an injection of current into the cell. It tells you the overall resistance of the cell in terms of the extent to which its membrane channels are open. So before the synaptic event, only the resting channels were open. But during the synaptic event, both the resting channels and the synaptic channels are open. It follows then that if you inject a current while the synaptic channels are open, then the input resistance you measure is going to be lower because there are more paths which current can travel through. There is less resistance. You can find the new input resistance or conductance when the synaptic channels are open using a pretty intuitive calculation. Just take the conductance of the resting channels that were open by default and add it to the conductance of the synaptic channels. There are more channels available now, so it's natural that the conductances would add up. Note that I've denoted this conductance by G in sin to indicate the input conductance during the synaptic event. I can calculate this using the G in and this G sin to get a conductance of 2.5 nanosiemens. The input resistance during the synaptic event would then just be 1 divided by this, which is 400 mega ohms. Notice how this is smaller than the original input resistance of 500 mega ohms. And that makes sense because the synaptic channels have now opened and the resistance to flow of current is less since there are more paths available for current to flow through. The time constant during the synaptic event would then just be the new input resistance during the synaptic event times the capacitance of the cell. We know the capacitance from earlier, so the time constant is just 5.03 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds, or 5.03 milliseconds. So we're done with parts A, B, and C, which just leaves us with part D of the problem. And what that part B says is that if the duration of the synaptic current I sin, the same one we found in part B, if the duration of that current was 2.4 milliseconds, what is the peak amplitude of the EPSP? So let me draw a graph of what's going on. You're injecting a synaptic current of 25 picoamps, which is what I sin was. You're injecting that current into the cell for 2.4 milliseconds. As you inject that current, the membrane potential of the cell will rise because you're making the cell more positive by injecting more current into it. This change in membrane potential is part of the EPSP, or the excitatory postsynaptic potential. Now when you stop injecting the current once the 2.4 milliseconds are up and the synaptic channels close, then the cell once again returns to its original resting potential. What the question wants is it wants you to find the peak amplitude of the EPSP, and by peak amplitude I mean the peak change from the baseline membrane potential, so this change right here. 
this peak amplitude occurs just as when you finish injecting the synaptic current, so right at t equals 2.4 milliseconds. How you would find this peak amplitude is you would use a voltage equation back from first year physics or from your lecture notes. Basically, as you inject the synaptic current, the shape this voltage curve takes is given by this function. So delta V of t is I synaptic times the input resistance when the synaptic channels are open times 1 minus the exponential of negative t over the time constant, where the R in sin is, of course, the input resistance while the synaptic channels are open, and the tau sin is the time constant while the synaptic channels are open. All you have to do now is plug in the values. Synaptic current you already know is 25 picoamps. Synaptic input resistance is 400 megaohms, and the synaptic time constant is 5.03 milliseconds. And the time for which we want the peak EPSP amplitude is 2.4 milliseconds. When you do the calculation, you get approximately 3.79 millivolts. And that's it. You've finished the first problem in my electrophysiology problem series. If you found this video useful, or even if you found it completely useless, please let me know in the comments. I'll be sure to allocate my time accordingly. Thanks for watching.